Hello and good evening. My name is Keith Estery and I am with Tour Carvel Magazine and Maine and Mulberry. I'm so glad that you've chosen to spend a little time with us this evening. Uh, we are going to be asking questions in a kind of a deba debate format of all of the candidates that are running for alderman position in Carville. I can't tell you how important it is to pay attention to these elections. I know a lot of times we focus on what's happening at a national and federal level, uh, but really important as these officials can affect our daily lives. And so we've got a great show for you here tonight. Um, we have to give you a little bit about the format. We have issued to all of the aldermen candidates um, in advance six questions. And we've asked them to choose two of those six of which they would like to be asked and which they would like to answer. So they have submitted those back to us. So as we go through the debate, which we'll be doing position by position, as we go through the debate, um, each candidate will be able to give an intro, tell a little bit about themselves, answer those two questions. And then we've also come up with a list of random questions. We've placed those in envelopes and each position, each debate position will choose one of those questions randomly. A lot of those have been inspired by the community. Uh, they'll choose one of those randomly and then each person, each candidate will be answering that same question so that you can get a little bit of a debate style there of how they differ um, on the same question. So some of it is the candidates communicating what they want to you by choosing their questions and others are random. Um, and so we hope that that will give you a little bit of an introduction to these candidates. We certainly don't have the time. We have 11 candidates running. We'd be here for a long time if we really wanted to dig in get in depth um, and understand all about their positions, but they all have uh, websites. They um, all have um, or, or ways to connect with them if they don't. Um, all are open to speak with you. So what we want to do tonight is just allow them each to introduce themselves, give you a little bit about um, their background, where they stand on a few issues, and then you really need to dig in beyond that. Um, please don't let just this debate be the only thing that makes up your mind. Um, there's a lot more information out there. I think maybe even some more community forums um, coming. So I want you to really stay engaged. And uh, we have recorded this. I'll tell you, it's going to be a little different. We have pre-recorded this for streaming tonight um, at the Herald Theater. And we thank the town for allowing us to use that venue. Uh, we took every precaution that we could for COVID-19. It was not open to the public. Uh, you'll see the candidates tonight wearing masks unless they're at the podium. When they leave the podium, they will have to wipe it down with bleach wipes. Um, and so you'll see a lot of precautions going on. It's just uh, the, the day that we live in right now. So uh, we've done everything that we can to be safe. We hope we give you a good introduction to these candidates. And uh, at this point, I'm going to flip us over uh, to the recording of the debate. Uh, hope you enjoy it. And thanks for being with us. Welcome to the Alderman Debate by Tour Carnival Magazine. Uh, we're here at the Herald Theater, and we want to thank the town for allowing us to use this. We also have uh, State Representative Kevin Vaughn co-hosting with us. I'd like to thank Kevin Vaughn for being here as well. And the format of our debate tonight is multifaceted. Um, the first thing we've done is we've asked each candidate to pick a series of six questions. They will pick two out of six questions that they chose themselves of the six, and we will be asking them those questions. Then we will have a period where we will ask random questions. We're going to be doing this all by position. So uh, the first position we'll debate, Alderman, and then we'll move to another one. And so we're going to get started here for uh, time's sake and start with the first position, which is position three. And within the positions, we are going by alphabetical order. So at this time, that would be uh, Mr. Harold Curtis Booker, who we will ask to the podium. Uh, so, Mr. Booker, thanks for being here. And Mr. Booker, we'll start off with a one-minute introduction um, for, the, for the audience here. Thank you. Thank you for having me here this evening. My name is Harold Booker. And uh, I've been in Collierville with my wife and three children since 2008. Uh, my wife and I just had retired from the United States Army after 24 years serving faithfully, wearing the great nation of serving this country. And my wife had got reassigned to the Navy military base, and she was in uh, the Navy, retired after 30 years. And so total between both of us, we did 54 years of service to our great nation. Kids came to Collierville because we chose Collierville because of the excellent schools that they have here. And... Uh, since then, that's what kids came here, graduated, moved on. Uh, I'm being a candidate as an alderman for all citizens of Collierville. Democrats, Republicans, independent, doesn't matter. My thing is I'm here to serve the city and town of Collierville, and I'm going to do the best that I can to fulfill those responsibilities as a citizen, and I'm here to serve. Um, the reason why I decided to run uh, and about August, early part of August, I was decided to uh, ask several, by several people to consider strongly to run for alderman. I thought about it, prayed about it, and I was led to go file a 
petition to run for alderman, and that's why I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Booger. At this point, um, one minute for Mr. Swan. My name is Thomas Swan. I've been a resident of Collierville since 2005. I've got a wife that's an ER nurse and three rambunctious little children, and we've decided that we're going to continue and make Collierville our home. One of the reasons that I've been interested in running for this, which was seems kind of spur at the moment, but felt duty bound, was I wanted us to have a choice in our direction, take a look at where we are, where we're going, and where we want to be. It's difficult to say sometimes um, what can motivate a person, but I look at my children and decide that I really want a safe community, a community that they can be proud of, first-rate schools and education, and all the things that Carryville has to offer. And I hope to be able to provide that for them in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swan. All right, Alderman John Worley. One minute, sir. Good evening. My name is John Worley. <clears throat> I uh, started working out in Cuyahoga in 1983 and found that it was a place that I wanted to raise my family. I moved uh, out here and, and built a house in 1985 and loved the community. And uh, I ended up raising six kids. My wife, Donna, and I have six kids and nine grandchildren. And uh, that uh, is something we enjoy every day in our, our lives. Uh, I want to talk about... Uh, uh, today, and um, public safety is very important for the town of Cuyahoga, as well as I want to keep our taxes low, as well as maintain uh, a stable environment uh, for development. Um, Cuyahoga has been good to me. I served on several committees. Uh, uh, then I decided to, uh, uh, to get into a uh, uh, board for construction appeals, and then uh, Mayor Curley appointed at the Planning Commission and Mayor Joyner then appointed me Planning Commission. So after serving on the Planning Commission since 2006, I decided to run for Alderman in 2012 and was reelected in 2016 and hope to have your support for 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Worley. And at this point, we'll begin the questions aspect uh, where we each person, again, remind you, we provided them in advance six questions. Each person chose two. Uh, they'll answer one and then go through a rotation back around to answer their second question. I'm going to turn it over um, to Representative Vaughn. And, uh, Kevin, if you would like to say an introduction, as I did, as before we move into this segment of the, the question portion, you're welcome to. And then I'll have you call up uh, the, the alderman candidate for the first question. Sure, and thanks, Keith. We all, I can say I speak for the entire community that we appreciate Tour Cogable's effort in putting this uh, program together tonight. Uh, we have a series of six questions. Each candidate was able to choose the two that they wanted to message to you, the listener, the most about. Uh, they had their choice. And so what you'll hear throughout this next segment will be people, you'll, you'll hear the, the, the things that are most important to our candidates and what they plan to do about it. So with that, we're going to invite uh, candidate uh, Harold Booker back to the, back to the podium. And Mr. Booker, uh, the first question that you've chosen uh, out of the six to want to uh, answer is, in your career or otherwise, do you have experience developing a multifaceted budget? Thank you for the question. Yes to the uh, answer. Uh, having said that, uh, throughout my military career, particularly in the last 20 years of my 24 years, I've served in leadership positions that uh, put me in a position to have a seat at the table in the process of developing and implementing the budget. As we all know, the budget is not, in an organization, is not derived by a single individual. It comes by uh, department heads and the finance department, et cetera, and it'd be no difference here as a, as a board member of the alderman. So again, you have the department heads that end up working in conjunction with the town administrator and bringing in the, uh, the mayor and the board of aldermen and flush it out on what the budget is going to be like. So it's not an individual person that's doing this, okay? Now, to give you some uh, quick uh, um, examples of some opportunities that I've had serving this great nation, I served as a, com uh, a contracting officer of serving over about $308 million, uh, where I've, if all the recruits has gone into the military. Uh, they had to stay in a hotel the night before they got shipped off. So 
uh, I oversaw that budget uh, for about 20,000 annual troops going into basic training. Another time I had a, about a $15 million budget that I oversaw in Fort Lewis, Washington, serving the community for the military and their dependents. And that consisted, again, of alcohol and drug abuse, uh, the recreation center within that particular community, and, uh, and we had lodging and resource management, and those facilities were, again, about a $22 million, a $15 million annual budget that I oversee. So I do have the experience, and, uh, and I'm bringing that to the table. Okay, so again, it's a col uh, collaboration of other department heads coming together. I personally went out and talked to all the department heads in, in uh, Kyville, uh extensively, if you will, to the point to where I got an insight, and that's what typically military do. They go out as a leader and talk when they come into a command and talk to all the different department heads to kind of get a lay of the land on what's going on in their department. So again, I have the experience, in, and I'm bringing that to the table for the citizens of Kyville. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And for the folks watching at home, uh, just from a hygiene standpoint, uh, everyone here is social distancing as well as uh, the candidate, each candidate sanitizes the microphone after they've answered their question maskless. So we do have a little bit of time as people go in and out and away from the podium while we take care of uh, the sanitation requirements of here at the Herald Theater. And next up is uh, candidate Thomas Swan. Thanks for stepping up. So the, the, the question, the first question that uh, Mr. Swan has chosen to answer are, what are the three largest issues that Carter will face over the next four years? Basically dealing with growth. The town we have, I believe it's on average anywhere between 150 to 200 housing units come in every year. Uh, with each of these housing units, you have to deal with road, you have to deal with sewer, we have to deal with water. And uh, not to mention just the infrastructure, but then you also have the public services, police, fire, what have you. We want to maintain the same excellent service that we've had over the years. I don't ever want to see that drop. Um, and to do that, I think we're going to have to start really looking at the budget. Um, I think right now, if you look just at our roads alone, um, they're on a... 30 year plus paving cycle and they're supposed to be renewed about every 14 years on average um, and I think we've seen that in some of the places in town so that's definitely something that needs to be looked at um, it doesn't seem to be a priority at the moment one of the other things that I am concerned about is um, growth and use inside the town of Carrieville as well commercial developments uh, one of the things that uh, has bothered me since I've been here has been uh, the uh, arrival of a large number of uh, apartments and a desire to put in um, high-density housing. And I know there's been um, a lot of opposition to that, as we've seen in recent proposals. So I definitely would like to uh, keep the ratio of uh, apartment units to homes to a reasonable level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swan. Next up will be uh, Alderman John Worley, and what I think would be the fitting thing to do here would be, just like your fantasy football draft, uh, and we're on the fly here, is if we go down first to last and then last to first coming back, does that make sense? Yeah, that'd be great. That's fine. Yeah. It's, it'll really pay dividends for, the, for those in position four. <laughs> so you want uh, so you want Mr. Worley to answer two in a row? Two in, yeah, he'll yeah, go two in a row, back. then okay. Mr. Swan will be back, and then Mr. Booker. Okay. We'll, we'll finish back. So, so you're going to go one, two here. Alderman Worley, sorry for the change on the fly, but it seemed like the thing to do. Uh, with, among the questions that you have chosen to ask, or to answer, excuse me, uh, is the same question that uh, candidate Booker had, had just answered, which was, in your career or otherwise, do you have experience developing a multifaceted budget? And the answer to that question is yes. In uh, my building and development business, we have to prepare a budget for every project we do, uh, give it to the bank. They have to approve our budget. we got to stay within budget. Also, I do have homeowners that are trying to stay in a, a budget on their house. We're uh, given a set of plans, got to give them a price, uh, budget those items, and then uh, try to keep them in budget. Uh, at the town of Calluville, <clears throat> I uh, uh, start in late January, work all the way through uh, June, putting our budget. We meet with all the uh, 
directors and find their needs as well as their wants. Unfortunately, in trying to keep a, a budget, uh, we've been providing needs, but sometimes we can't always get the wants. But we got to look at those those items and see what's uh, best for the best for the town. We had a hard decision a couple of years ago where we had to lay off people in order to keep uh, the line on our our tax rate. We had to lay off a bunch of people, and there was roughly 16, 18 positions that were unfilled. We decided not to fill those positions. So overall, we uh, probably roughly 20 to 25 people. Uh, positions we save money as well as uh, we didn't give uh, uh, increased our employees which felt very hard for all of us on the board some decisions are very tough and that was one that we had to do um, so in the future uh, we want to stay within budget and uh, and we have we got at the lowest tax rate probably of our closer municipalities we're cheaper in Germantown the same uh, tax rate is at Bartlett Bartlett is uh, one project that I kind of saved the town a lot of money on, we were have a called Royal Pecan drainage project is over off of White Road. We had several neighbors that had water come in the back of their, their houses. And our, uh, we had an estimate from engineers that said it was going to cost $1.3 million. I sat down with our town engineer. We got, got together, met with the homeowners, and worked a, a project out. We got it done for $520,000 after doing it in, in-house. So if, if I hadn't been on the board, I saved us roughly $780,000 on that one project. Thank you. All right. Well, so, <laughs> that way you don't have to clean the mic. <laughs> you get lucky you don't have to clean the mic. Yeah. <clears throat> Keith, you want to hit him with the next one? Oh, yeah, I can. All right. So, uh, Mr. Worley, the second question that you chose to answer was, what are the three largest issues that Carrierville will face over the next four years? I think the first one, and, and most importantly, is public safety. Uh, the times we're uh, dealt with today, I think our citizens will want to make sure they're safe, that we have uh, the adequate amount of police department, as well as funding their needs, also the fire department. We've had... Uh, uh, a new police director that has gotten us up to uh, full capacity on our police officers. We were about a year ago having we were about 14 short on police officers. Now we're at full capacity, and we have a waiting line of people that applied to, to work for the town of Cuyahoga. So uh, we've really turned the police department around for the best of Cuyahoga. Our fire department, we had an instance the other day where we had uh, – a new fire truck we put in operation in the first week. They had a tracer line that they were able to use to go in a house and, and work themselves through a fire over there in uh, over where Alderman and Alderman used to live off of uh, Shelton Road. So we're having providing good equipment for our people. So um, we've. Um, done a lot of things, but I want to keep our, our taxes low. Our, our taxes uh, are, like I say, we're at $1.83. Germantown's a $1.96, and Bartlett's a $1.83. So we've got in that $1.83, 25 cents for the high school building, and that was a bond issue. We also got a AAA bond rating. There's only a handful of states, uh, a handful of cities in our state that have a AAA bond rating. So that's able to us to be able to issue bonds at a lower rate than other municipalities. Um, the third thing is, is sustainable growth. I'm in the development business, but if you look on the uh, June the 13th, 2016 uh, BMA meeting, I was the one standing up for our citizens and not spending over $1.2 million for other developers to get uh, sewer and water. It, I felt the sewer and water, I've done it myself, have paid for that sewer and water myself, not made uh, the town of Cuyahoga pay for it. So if you look at that June 13th, 2016 BMA meeting where I made a point that uh, development's got to stand on its own. Thank you. Appreciate it. So going in reverse order, we'll go back to Mr. Swan. Correct. All right, Mr. Swan, uh, your second question uh, chosen by you is, do you believe it's important to have a diversified tax base uh, and either why or why not? Absolutely. Um, we have two sources of income for Collierville. We've got sales tax, and then we've got the property tax. The property tax moves fairly slowly in value, and it's readjusted when the, all the properties are reassessed about every four years. Um, as far as sales tax go, this is actually something that reacts fairly quickly based upon the health of your local economy. Um, if Collierville has something to offer, other residents can come in from outside, they can do their commerce here, and we actually have a way to recruit additional income or to uh, attract additional income through the services and facilities and products and services that we can have inside the town. 
Um, and it's definitely important to keep both options available. Um, if we tie ourselves to just property values, an economic slump could, could pull down the available income for the town. If we just rely on sales tax, an economic slump can also affect the town as well. So we really want to keep uh, both sources, both sources available to the town. And I think it's important to make sure that the town has the resources it needs to provide the services to the citizens. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Swan. All right, coming back to candidate Booker, uh, let's see. You're the second question of the six that you wanted to uh, reply to is question number four. Do you believe that the town of Carville has enough law enforcement? Um, I would have to say yes to that, and, uh, and I'm being able to answer that because I went and talked to the police chief uh, in my quest for this position. Uh, just again, that's what a good leader do. They go out and talk to the people that's on the ground, in the trenches, okay? And um, based on the conversation I had with him and his assistant, they properly are staffed at this moment, 109 officers. And I do recall the last year or two, they had to hire some police officers to get up to speed. Um, so again, they up to speed on that. Uh, I, I take my hat off to our Collierville Police Department, though. Um, and these are some things that I kind of heard about it, but I found more out about it as um, having this conversation and talking to some of the police officers, that the makeup of Collierville police officers uh, is probably better than a lot of the cities um, when you look at it. Um, and when I talk about I'm talking about the captains and lieutenant that's been to the FBI Academy, uh, the training they received there, and then you got the additional police officers that's on the ground that's getting that additional training. Rather, we got K-9 training going on, um, SWAT team, uh, crisis management team, uh, crisis intervention team. These are all additional uh, experts that they typically would have to bring in. And here, Collierville has that. And again, that is tremendously. And the thing that Collierville Police is trying to do is build trust and partnership within the citizens of Collierville. That's awesome. Uh, they have that night out and um, where they go out in town and talk to different citizens in the neighborhoods. Um, so they really want to build that trust and partnership, if you will, and that's make people feel home. So public safety is number one priority on a lot of citizens, including myself. So if and when police officers, as we grow, um, police officers got to be expanded and they need, they're going to have to have needs that need to be met. So hopefully the BMA will go to the citizens and be transparent and explain to the citizens what's that need, what's that state. Um, if we don't get the police officers what they need. So it's important, again, that we accommodate the police officers so they can do their job and uh, we can stay safe here within the town limits. Thank you, Mr. Booker. At this point, each candidate has been able to answer two of the six questions that were provided to them. And we're going to move into a little bit more of a uh, rapid question answer. And we're going to ask the candidates to pick one question randomly. We've provided a series of questions that the candidates have not seen before. Um, they're going to pick that randomly, and then I believe Mr. Vaughn will ask that question, and each candidate will, a will have the opportunity to answer that question with two minutes each. By the way, just let me say that I appreciate the large font that whoever typed this question used. <laughs> yeah. All righty, here we go. Uh, Mr. Booker, have you ever supported a Collierville nonprofit, either financially or by volunteering? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, I've... I've I've always supported nonprofit uh, organizations. I'm actually a board member uh, for Youth Leadership Memphis, which is a nonprofit organization located in Memphis, Tennessee, where it's geared to assist and help uh, youth, mostly from single family backgrounds. Uh, you get with them, you mentor them, uh, you teach them. Uh, you know things about life in general. We take them out on Saturday, feed them. Uh, go out and do yards, cutting, raking, et cetera, with them. So I'm on that board member as well as uh, volunteering with them. I'm involved with uh, the mentoring program here at Collierville High School and middle school where not just myself but also my wife, uh, where we go and uh, mentor to the kids um, at all those level grades that I just mentioned. Uh, I did that also in the city of Memphis schools where I went back and I uh, was able to teach back uh, ROTC, volunteering on ROTC programs, and as well, mentoring those kids. 
So I'm still involved, has always been mentoring in the school system, now, uh, not just the school system, but also at the uh, church that we're a member of. So that's, that is part of what I do. Uh, committed to selfless service. I did it, again, for the whole time I was in the military, and I'm committed to continue to do it now as a civilian. Um, so uh, I bring that to Collierville, and again, I want to be a part of the board as an alderman because I feel I have the time. Um, I'm retired, and that's my full-time job is wanting to give back to the citizens of Collierville, and what other better way would I be able to do that to bring the, the skills the, the, uh, and all the experience that I've had to the table or sitting at the table with the aldermen and help moving the town of Collierville to be a better place for everybody, for all of us to live in. And so that's why I'm running. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up is uh, Mr. Thomas Swan. And Mr. Swan, the, the question that was drawn states have, or asks, have you ever supported a Collierville nonprofit either financially or by volunteering? And please share a little bit more about the answer. Thank you. Particularly non Collierville nonprofits, we've worked with um, church that we attend, Christ United Methodist Church. We've also worked with the Collierville Literacy Council. Um, part of their mission is uh, something that I'm, I'm fairly passionate about. We've actually even used their services before. And um, people that can read, communicate, and learn are going to make the best citizens that we have. And I think that it's important to drive that, to grow it, and to nurture anybody that asks for help. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. And finally, Alderman Worley, your turn at the question. I'll repeat it. Have you ever supported a Collierville nonprofit either by financial means or by volunteering? And if, if, you ha if the answer is yes, please elaborate, or if it's no, please elaborate. Uh, yes, I've tried to support um, many of our nonprofits in, in Collierville. Uh, we have Project Graduation, which uh, benefits our seniors as they graduate. They, they usually have a party, uh, used to have it sometimes at the gymnasium or uh, at, actually where we're at over here right now. They've had one of the uh, parties. So I've always really tried to donate to Project Graduation for the kids to keep them out of trouble on gradu graduation night. I've supported uh, YM the YMCA. Uh, when asked upon, uh, when schools ask upon us to, or the library ask us to read, I've gone to uh, several of the schools to read on uh, reading day. Uh, I remember going uh, not too long ago, it seemed like, uh, it, was, it was last year, I guess, at the uh, Cuyahoga Elementary School, and they had a shortage of actually readers, and I actually read to uh, uh, two different classes, uh, maybe May 3 that year. So they were shorted. So we need more readers uh, reading in our Cuyahoga schools. And one, I know this is not a Cuyahoga one, but uh, uh, we actively, our family participates with Mid-South Transplant Organization, which they have come out here and spoke at our local chamber, which I've uh, been a supporter of our local chamber. That's, But the Mid-South Transplant Foundation, I've had uh, one daughter that's had uh, one liver transplant, another daughter's had three liver transplants. Uh, so we actively support Mid-South Transplant Foundation and, and we hope that uh, the town of Kiowa would also support them also. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Alderman Worley, you'll have the first crack at it. Sum, sum up what you want the, the citizens of the great town of Kiowa to know about uh, Alderman John Worley. Uh, as a resident for Kiowa since 1985, which is 35 years, I've, I've enjoyed uh, being in the community, watch it grow from 7,000 to you know, we're waiting on our uh, census, but let's say 53,000 people. So it's, it's been a fun experience watching it grow. I think it's grown in, in the proper way. Uh, I've served on the Planning Commission when Mayor Curley said she wouldn't have a builder or developer on the, the Planning Commission. And when I talked to her in the year 2000, and in 2006, she called me and said, John, she said, I realize I need you. I need somebody that understands the development business because we don't have anybody there that understands that can deal with all the issues and you understand the infrastructure is good or better than anybody in town. So I take that as a challenge and have saved the town of Kiowa a lot of money uh, by being on the board. Uh, Kiowa is a fun place to live. Like I say, we have the, the terminology live, work, play. I, I do all that here in Kiowa. Uh, I look forward to, after serving eight years on on the board, uh, I'd love to serve another four years. And like I say, I've served on the Planning Commission. And the, uh, our BMA board unanimously selects me, selected me the last eight years to be their liaison on the, uh, on the Planning Commission. So obviously they have the uh, support. Uh, I, they got 
uh, they gave me the support for them to uh, deal with those issues. Thank you, and I look forward to uh, catching you on the campaign trail. Thank you. All right, candidate Swan. Wanted to thank everybody for this opportunity to speak to you, to uh, share my thoughts and ideas, and in my passion for the town of Cargerville. We've got wonderful assets. We've got great schools, a great sense of community. We've got superb police force. We've got wonderful fire department, and we've got you know just just a wonderful town. And I want to see that continue uh, for my children, all of our children. Uh, into the future. Um, one of the things that I uh, wanted to bring about was I've got no other point of gain in the town than to see it grow and be a safe place for all of our families and for us to enjoy in the future. I would hope that y'all would give me an opportunity to, uh, to serve as an alderman here in Cargerville. Um, and to be receptive to any of your ideas, comments, in the hopes that I can make this a better place. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Schwann. All right, Mr. Booger, that's you for one minute, and one and a half minutes for closing. Yes, thank you. Uh, as I uh, prepare to leave, I just wanted to leave with the citizens with this thought here. Uh, I came up initially and stated why I decided to put my name in the hat to run, and that was only because after receiving numerous emails and text messages to strongly consider on running based on the people that know me and know my worth and what I, but the value to bring to the table, um, thought about it, and I prayed about it, and uh, like I said, I was led to go fill out a petition and submit it. Uh, and the Lord, again, uh, if he sees it should be uh, his will, I'll be elected. Um, to serve as a BMA, and if not, he put me on this journey for another reason that I have not yet found out, nor would I find out until after November 3rd. Having said that, I bring all the years of experience, experience that I've had serving this great nation, my leadership, my experience, my strategic and tactical thinking, the, all that coupled with how I can resolve any conflict, if there should be any conflict. I'm ready to hit the ground day one to serve the citizens of Collierville. So if you ever receive, like me, get a call at 3 o'clock in the morning, I know what to do from day one. Okay, that's the training that I received that afforded me this opportunity to be right here, right now, to serve this town in Collierville. I know we have some challenges. I'm up to those challenges. Again, I had the time. I'm retired, and I'll be committed to serving this town for the citizens. I'll be a dedicated advocate for each and every one of you. Don't matter if you're Republican, Democratic, Independent. I'm look at the issues, and I will deal with each issue independently and make the best decision for the citizens with your input. Thank you, and I need your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Booker. At this point, that concludes our debate for Alderman Position 3, and we're going to take a quick break, and we will pick back up with Alderman Position 4. Thanks to all the candidates uh, for being here and for your time. Good job, sir. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thomas, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching the Tour Carnival Magazine Alderman Debate, and we have just gone through Position 3 and um, gone through a series of questions, and we're about to move into Position 4. And again, to remind of the format, we have pre-issued, pre-distributed six questions to each one of the candidates. And the candidates have had the opportunities to select two questions of those six, which they would like to answer. We'll also start with a one-minute introduction. The candidates will have one minute to introduce themselves. And so uh, we'll be bringing them up one by one uh, to go through that process. We're moving in alphabetical order throughout the candidates that are running for the position. Um, the candidates that are running are William Boone, Connor Lambert, Missy Marshall, Rick Rout, and Scott Rosansky. And so we will start with William Boone, if you can step up and have your one minute introduction. Good evening, everybody. My name is William Boone. I've been a citizen of Kyville since I was born here, uh, 1963. So for 57 years, I've been a citizen of Kyville. And I was on the fire department for, I served on the fire department as volunteer in 1982. Um, to 1984, um, came a, a full-time firefighter 
1984 for 31 and a half years. So uh, I also went to school, high school, elementary here, high school, uh, been here all my life. I'm serving, I want to serve the citizens of Kyrie. I want to continue that service to Kyrie because I have a love and a heart for Kyrie. I just, uh, I, I'd, I'd love to see, have, I have loved to see how Kyrie have grown throughout the years from approximately 500 people maybe when I was born all the way up to, to, the, to the present. So if you all would continue to let me serve you all for another 30 years, um, I would be very gladly appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boone. So, yeah, Mr. Lambert, if you could answer uh, or give us a one-minute introduction. Hello, my name is Connor Lambert, and I'm running for alderman because I believe we're facing problems that require more than status quo candidates with status quo solutions. In the midst of a current health and economic crisis, we are also facing a collective reckoning of racial injustice. These challenges require what Bobby Kennedy called the qualities of youth, a tipper of the will, a quality of imagination, a predominance of courage over timidity, an appetite for adventure over the life of ease. There are great challenges we face, but I believe we pass, possess the ability to not only survive, but thrive. It'll take hard work and trust in a system that has favored the few and marginalized the many. So if you're dissatisfied with the status quo, if you feel like our town has left you voiceless, I hear you, I see you, and I will fight for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lambert. Next up is Missy Marshall for a one minute introduction. Hi, I'm Missy Marshall. Um, I have called Collierville home since 2005. I, um, I'm running, one, because I saw this as an opportunity. I think that we should recognize that this seat is an open seat. It is fulfilling a two-year term, and um, I personally would like to uh, recognize and thank the family of Tom Allen um, for his service. He was a, he was a um, Vietnam veteran. He gave service to this town and um, loved this town. Public safety was first. And what I saw was an opportunity. I love Carrierville. I feel like we have excellent leadership here. The leadership that we have has placed the foundation that we've all grown to love, the reason that we're here. And I'm hoping that my uh, 25 plus years in public service can um, help continue to move the town forward and preserve the quality of life we've all come to love. All right, next up is uh, Mr. Rick Rout uh, for a one minute introduction. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for Tour, Tour Carnival and for Representative Vaughn putting this on tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rick Rout and I wanna be your alderman for position four. I think that we can all agree that this is a wonderful place to live. I chose to move my family here years ago. My family has been doing business here and, and praying here and uh, being here for a number of years now. And I believe also that there's a lot more that we can do. We have to do a lot of things besides just control uh, what we do with growth, a lot of, uh, with taxes, with what we do at the police department. We have wonderful police department. We have wonderful growth going on. We're the largest town in the state of Tennessee. But we have to keep that wholesomeness. And by doing that, we've got to control a few things, one being taxes. And by your being your voice and your alderman, I believe that we can move Carnival forward and we can have a better place to be. Thank you. Next up is Scott Rosansky. Hello, I'm Scott Rosansky and I'm running for Collierville Alderman position number four. And uh, I feel that I can provide superior Excuse me. Um, I feel that I can be a good candidate for position four. I've got over 35 years of business experience, 17 years of experience on Collierville boards and um, service, and I have the institutional knowledge and the to serve Collierville as an alderman on day one. Uh, as you can tell, I am not a great speaker. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I've done a lot of work in the community besides being on the boards. I've also volunteered in Leadership Collierville, been on Main Street Collierville board and past president. And the town of Collierville has been very good to me and my family, and I would like the opportunity to give back. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rosansky. Back. Thank you, Mr. Rosansky. And if you will, stay. hang out there for a moment. And 
we will yeah at this point also say that there uh, is another candidate running mr robert smith um, he is out on military duty and we're going to take a quick deviation from how it looks here to play uh, his answers uh, or his introduction virtually candidate robert smith uh, one minute introduction First, I'd like to thank uh, Tor Cargill for putting this debate together. I'm out of town for some military training at the moment, and my participation wouldn't be possible without them going above and beyond to fit me in. I'm Robert Smith. I'm a sixth generation resident of Cargill. I've lived here most of my life. My wife, Casey, and I live near the town square, uh, near uh, several other members of our large family uh, in the area. Uh, I'm an airline pilot and a pilot with the Tennessee Air National Guard uh, in Memphis. Uh, service has always been in my blood, uh, from helping out in church at a young age uh, to my military service. It's always been something I've been called to do. And now I'm looking to give back to Carrieville by uh, participating uh, and serving at the local government level. Uh, my three core values in this endeavor are promoting increased public safety, uh, pursuing a more limited and uh, sensible growth rate, and fiscal responsibility. I want to thank you for tuning in uh, to hear what uh, the other candidates and I have to say and for taking interest in your local government. Thank you. Everyone has answered their or, or given their one minute introduction for position four, Alderman in Carville, Tennessee. And we will move into a section where we will do some question and answer. And so I'm going to uh, pass it over to uh, Representative Vaughn. And Kevin, if you would take us through and kind of give us an introduction to what this section is, is about and take us through. Uh, start us off here. Sure thing, Keith. Uh, all of the candidates were provided six separate questions. Uh, in a list prior to joining us this evening. They had a choice of which two they would like to answer from, st from the stage tonight. Uh, and Mr. Rosansky, the first question off of our list of six that he had, that he decided he wanted to choose tonight was an answer, is in your career or otherwise, do you have experience developing a multifaceted budget? Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. Uh, yes, uh, in my 30 plus years of business experience, I've provided me many budget opportunities. Uh, they range from project budgets to uh, business operation versus revenue budgets, uh, project budgets and estimates. Uh, the most recently, the, I've done a project budget on a $32 million facility, uh, criminal justice facility, and these, this kind of project, you not only have development costs, you have site utility costs, and you have building costs, and the building is usually divided, in this case, to under 26 different um, categories and with its subcategories. So the complexity of what we see with Collierville and its budgets, um, this is a microcosm of that. Um, also, it has, I, with business budgets, I have put together operational and revenue generating projections for our, my company for over 15 years now. And those budgets include personnel issues, insurance, regulations, uh, you gotta project for uh, unforeseen things, similar things to what, a, again, a microcosm of what the town's budgets are like. The town itself, you've got, even in the, just in the general funds, you have 12 different funds that you have to look at. You have 500 employees that are covered under that general funds and it's worth about $62 million of value. And you just have to take it one piece at a time. So with that, um, I just would like the opportunity to serve the community, and thank you for your time. All right, Mr. Rout, you're back at the podium uh, preparing to answer the following question. Cairoville has the ability to annex several areas that are now deemed the Cairoville Reserve areas including land by the high school. I believe it's east of the high school is the Carville uh, yes, Reserve area there. Do you think the Carville should be looking to expand geographically? I think we always should be looking to expand, whether it be to the north, the south, or the east. We can't expand to the west due because of Germantown, but uh, I think that we always need to be looking for growth in Carville. I think that what we also need to do is make sure we have controlled growth. I don't think that we should just annex something because it's there. I think we should make sure we do some studies and make sure that we are annexing something and we can pay for it on the front end. You know, when you annex something, you have to pay for uh, streets, sewers, gutters, police protection, fire protection. I've had the opportunity, I'm actually the only candidate on the stage that has spoken with Chief Lane 
about the police department and spoken to the chief of police, I mean, chief of uh, the fire department. And they're both in great shape. They're both doing a wonderful job. But that's one worry that they have is making sure that they have enough protection for the areas that we grow and we, and we move into. I think controlled growth is the most vital aspect that we have for the growth of Carville, whether it be to the east or to the north or to the south. Uh, I do think that what we can do is make sure that we put together a plan and look towards the future. And it's not just the controlled growth that we have, but we need to look and see where are we going to put that growth? Where are we going to put residential areas? Where are we going to put business er businesses so that we don't have a convenience store in the backyard of somebody's house? And I believe that if we look at that and we take care of our constituents and we also have the growth that we need, whether it be in business, small business and large business, and also uh, with our residential areas, we can keep Carville, the small town atmosphere that we have, and still grow and remain the largest town in the state of Tennessee. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And Ms. Marshall, you too are going to be given the opportunity to describe your multifaceted budgeting experience. Um, so when you feel comfortable. Yes, sir. Um, in my nearly 28 years of public service, I had the opportunity to work within eight state departments um, along nine state commissioners. In that role, I was responsible for um, um, putting together our budget as well as working on the executive team to prepare the budget for the state department. So I understand the different revenue streams. I understand um, how uh, projective revenues can impact the, the change in a budget that require decisions to be made that sometimes um, can result in budget cuts. Um, I feel like the town of Collierville has done an excellent job in being good fiscal stewards of our resources. They understand they're not um, dependent on one single revenue stream. They understand that they have to continually monitor the budget to make sure that um, at the end of the, that we're preparing and that we um, deliver a balanced budget to the citizens. Currently in my role, I um, am responsible for a statewide community service organization where I manage a $1.3 million budget. So I do feel like I have the budget experience um, to help um, contribute to the success of our town. All righty, thank you. Next up is Connor Lambert. Mr. Lambert, the first question that you've chosen to ask of, off of our list of six is uh, also <coughs> the budgeting question. If you could share with us your experience developing a multifaceted budget. So, of course, as a 21-year-old, I haven't had the 10, 20 years of experience that some of my colleagues might have had dealing with multi-million dollar budgets. But if I could expand the notion of what I think budgetary experience means. Um, most of the colleagues on, my sta on the stage have pointed to business budgets as an example. However, I don't think business budgets en encapsulate well enough what it's like to govern and provide a government budget. Um, not everything that is profitable is a social benefit and not everything of social value is profitable. Um, if we wanna talk about what is for the best for the public good and public interest, especially now during um, the COVID crisis and our economic crisis. I think our town should look towards all sources of revenue, all sorts of tools, be bold in our action to provide the support that our local businesses need during this time, and also provide for the health of our citizens. Um, so I may not have this business experience that everyone else um, has, but I do, have uh, I do have experience engaging in public interest I serve as director of a philanthropy organization at uh, Rhodes College. I have been vice president of Rhodes Tennessee Intercollegi Intercollegiate State Legislature, where I identify and address um, these sorts of budgetary concerns, but also balancing them with what is in the public good and public interest. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lambert. All righty, and, and uh, Mr. Boone, when you come to the, to the podium, You'll answer this question and you will receive the next question as well as we start around back around the cycle. So you'll be here for the next two questions. Okay. And the question that you had, believe it or not, is not about multifaceted budgeting. The question you selected, and I say that because we've had several of those in a row, uh, is about the annexation reserve area. 
Carville has the ability to annex several areas that are deemed the Carville Reserve, including the land by the high school. Do you think that Carville should be looking to expand geographically? I'm not, I'm, I'm never objecting to expanding, but what we need to do is take care of the infrastructure that's already here. We got, uh, especially with the pandemic going on, we got bad roads, uh, we got uh, water mains that need to be taken care of. Um, when you annex, you're talking about more police, more fire. We have to have a smart annexation. I'm not opposed. I'm not. I'm not objecting to annexation. I think it's good. But talking to some of the citizens right now, they don't feel like that they have uh, the service that everyone else have. That they've all the people who've already been annexed out uh, in the uh, south in the in the southwest. Uh, we have a lot of area to cover in Collierville in the southwest that we that we've uh, annexed. Right now, we got to make sure that those people are taken care of. We need to make sure that uh, what we have already can be taken care of. Um, we got uh, some of the worst streets right now because uh, we have gotten behind on some things. And so I'm not, like I say, I, I, don't, I don't think that right now is, is a good time to annex right now, but uh, later on down the road, I think we need to be looking into the annex. All righty, thank you, sir. Okay. And like I said, Hold tight. Okay. You're you're going to answer the next question that you've selected. And Kevin, if you would, we need to just take a quick break. Remind everybody because we're going to take a quick break, and we will also virtually now bring in Robert Smith to answer um, his first question. Candidate Smith, of the questions you provided, you chose your first question to be: um, Carville has the ability to annex several areas that are deemed Carville Reserve, including land by the high school. Do you think Carville should be looking to expand geographically? You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, yes, I do think um, uh, geographic expansion is something that Carville should look into. Um, like most things, it has pros and cons. Uh, some pros would be a uh, more expanded tax base uh, with more people contributing to the system. Uh, it hopefully would, uh, in theory, uh, reduce the burden on everyone. Um, and. Uh, some cons would be, of course, that uh, more services would be, have to be provided. Um, but if we could uh, provide the exact same level of services uh, to the new residents uh, as uh, the ones currently in our uh, town uh, limits, I think it's definitely something we could do. Um, another potential advantage would be um, uh, that uh, hopefully if we could uh, use the new tax dollars wisely and limit it to use just for the new uh, expanded services uh, to cover the new areas, uh, that uh, could be a financially responsible move uh, as long as we don't spend that money on, uh, on other things that aren't uh, related to uh, the new annexation. So Candidate Smith, the second question that you chose to answer um, was regarding the diversified tax base. And do you believe it's important to have a diversified tax base and why or why not? Absolutely. Uh, having a diversified tax base, uh, which we already largely do, um, I think is very important. Um, we rely on a, a wide range of uh, tax sources uh, from property taxes in the residential, commercial, and industrial classes, uh, as well as uh, alcohol tax, business uh, license taxes, motor vehicle taxes, and sales taxes. Um, the large uh, majority of our uh, tax uh, income is from property taxes, and that's something I'd like to uh, see kept low. Uh, so I think uh, having the diversification, just like you would diversify your, your 401k investments, uh, is important. Uh, can insulate us uh, when bad things happen, like a, a global pandemic or uh, even a housing market crash, like we saw in 2008. Uh, what we want to avoid is, um, you know, one, one sector uh, or one uh, segment of our uh, tax income falling short, um, such as property taxes. If the housing market were to uh, crash again, uh, we don't want to see the assessments um, decrease and then the town try to raise the rates to uh, to try to keep that income. And then when the recovery happens, uh, that, uh, that rate may not uh, get lowered again. So having, uh, having other sources that we can rely on and kind of evenly distributed uh, is good. Maybe we can rely on you know, sales tax in an instance like that. Um, but yes, uh, keeping taxes low is something that's very important to me. And uh, having that uh, diversity uh, in um, income types is, is important to ensure that happens. All right, Mr. Boone. Uh, 
The second question that you've selected that you uh, would like to provide an answer for this evening is, do you believe that Kyrville has enough law enforcement? That's, that's a wide question. Right now, uh, they're, they're back up to standard like they should. But as, as things go on, as, as you see as the news and me having experience, there's more and more stuff coming out east. We're getting cars broken into uh, right out east. So things are coming out this way. I'm, not, I'm always wanting to have more than less police officers. I think having more is better than not having enough or just having just enough. Uh, it's here again, out, north, out northwest, some of the annexation area that we've, that we've gotten, the response time is way big, way long, longer out that way. I think everybody ought to have the same opportunity. If, if the police respond to your area in four minutes, then everybody else should have that same opportunity if they're paying the same taxes. Uh, but as, as of right now, I, I think we might uh, be okay, but I think we need to be looking into having more police officers. It's, you can never be too safe. All right. Thank you. Mr. Lambert. All right. The second question of the six that you have chosen goes like this. What are the three largest issues that Carville will face over the next four years? I think the largest issues we face, more than just three, but a little, little subset of three, is the COVID crisis and our economic crisis. Like I said before, we're facing an unprecedented, unprecedented health crisis that's also affecting our local economies. Our local businesses are at risk. Our schools, our teachers, our students aren't at school right now, or it's dangerous for them to be there. As the son of a school teacher, I know how important it is that students are in the classroom, but I also know it's important to keep the teachers safe as well. And even if the timelines are correct and we do get a vaccine in a couple of months, um, things will not be go back to normal, as what, at least what the experts say. So we're dealing with a long haul crisis. Um, we need to, like I said, we need to open all the tools, open all the doors, um, leave no stone unturned to make sure that what Carnival is, is able to survive this crisis. That means supporting local businesses, especially on the square, to make sure they're profitable, but also managing the public health safely. That means working with our teachers and students to make sure that classrooms are safe and productive. That means making sure that we invest now in outdoor resources so our, our, our citizens can gather in safe ways. That means investing in parks to provide more amenities, more structures for more outdoor events. Um, I, I don't know what the next four years look like. I don't know what the next two years look like, but we have to take action to preserve what makes Carville Carville. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, we're back with, uh, to continue along with our discussion and our uh, getting to know the candidates for position four. Uh, I believe coming to the podium now is uh, Missy Marshall. All right, Miss Marshall, what do you believe are the three largest issues that Carville will face over the next four years? Uh, I believe the long-term effects of the COVID-19 pandemic is a issue that um, the leaders in Carville will have to face, and us as citizens, um, as right now. It, uh, it appears, you know, the federal government has poured in a lot of um, some finances and resources as far as, far as the state government. And, and people were uh, making home improvements and sales tax at revenues were actually up, I think you reported um, the other day. However, um, on the back end, we also have schools that are closed. We have businesses that are closing, um, you know, the students that are impacted. People want an educated workforce. They want our students to um, be prepared. And I think those were some of the challenges that we're facing right now with our schools closed. The other issue is things that are beyond our control. Um, for instance, the decisions that are made at the state and local government, decisions that Shelby County government makes, we have seen during this pandemic affects the municipalities. And so I think those are real issues that our leaders need to be able to uh, address and be prepared for. Um, the three of the, the things that um, I'm running on are my priorities. Yes, is public safety is number one, first priority. Our town does an excellent job out of it, almost a $62 million budget. The top amount of resources are allocated to public safety. Um, but responsible growth and um, development and 
development, we may be looking at the need for redevelopment with businesses closing, such as the Steinmart and um, the Pier 1. We have empty buildings around the state or around the, the community, and we need to be prepared to look at ways to um, redevelopment and build back into our community. And um, and civic engagement and leadership. I think the downfall of many uh, nations, countries, states, and communities are uh, as the result of the lack of leadership. And so I commend um, my fellow opponents here for putting themselves out there and running um, because we really do uh, need to look at cultivating and growing future leaders. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Rout, welcome back to the podium. I do a diversified tax base. Yes, sir. Could you share with us why you believe that's important or why you don't think that's important? I believe it's critical we have a, a diversified tax base. Uh, by saying that, I mean we need to have a strong tax base, not only with residential, with small business, and with large business. One thing that we're not doing is not enough of it. We need to have a broader base to, to come from, to get from, and to get to. What I mean by that is we are not going out and we're not getting the businesses that we can get when other counties and, and other municipalities are. We have a great distribution center, a great uh, industrial park that's being underutilized. We need to go to Nashville. We need to, to get those dollars that we need to come back and help expand that. We need to go out and get the businesses and let them know that Carville is a great place to live. Carville is a great place to be. And we need to let them know that they can come to Carville and they can be a strong, good member of the community. And they can provide uh, not only just a tax base, but they can provide families to go to churches. They can provide um, kids to go to school and a, great and a great place for families to be raised in. So what we're not doing, I believe, is we are doing a lot in development on residential. We're doing some development in small business, but we need to be more proactive on making sure we put those in the right spot. And we need to make sure that we go and get those businesses. And what we possibly need to do is go find someone and hire them to promote Carville and promote them. We have a lot, there's a lot of counties with a lot of cities and towns in them that have hired people to go out and get that business. They bring in a lot of economic revenue. And we need to make sure that we get that piece of the pie. Right now, we're not doing that. And we need to make sure that we can get our piece of the pie so that we can have that growth that we want in a controlled atmosphere, be physically responsible, and be able to broaden our tax base without expanding so much that we put a burden on our services. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Rosansky, you will get the final chosen question, and then you will be the question drawer. Your final, the final question, or the, the second question that you chose, uh, was the same question that uh, Mr. Rout just answered. Uh, share with your thoughts, your thoughts with us regarding a diversified tax base for our community. Yes, I, I believe we need to have a diversified tax base. Um, you know, old adage is you don't put all your eggs in one basket, and so you know that's what we need to make sure we're doing. Um, a lot of communities that I see and we go to, they primarily look at property taxes. That puts a high burden on a small group. And, and that, doesn't, that, that makes it difficult to make um, investments in the community because every time you do, you have to go back out and increase taxes. And most states and most areas, and ours does, we have limit to what you can do with that. Um, sales taxes, um, other you know, user fees, and other kind of taxes need to be used in order to diversify that revenue stream especially at a time like now with COVID and small businesses suffering, we need the ability to have more revenue streams so that it softens the blow from one sector to another uh, being hampered by the economy, the economic downturn. With that, we also have residential and commercial development. And those two things you need to balance. Um, and the balance can change from depending on what the growth patterns we're looking at what our 2040 plan, things like that. So when we balance those correctly, um, you know, commercial pays a higher rate than residential. Residential can have some higher usage. So we need to be cautious about that. We need to apply those correctly. And again, we just cannot have all of our eggs in one basket. Thank you. Thank you, sir. At this point, that concludes um, the answering of the pre-issued questions. Again, each candidate was issued six questions. They were able to choose two on their own of those six that they wanted to address. And we're moving into a little bit of a different phase where we have prepared a uh, 
un undisclosed to the candidates. We have prepared a set of questions, and they will be able to choose one of those questions randomly, and then each will be able to provide an answer to that question. We're going to go back to Mr. Rosansky as he um, was at the is at the podium and ask you to pick one and hand it to me, if you would. Okay, this question uh, chosen randomly. I will be asked of each one of the candidates, and you'll have uh, two minutes to respond and would like you to respond um, when more with this question than just a yes or no answer, but a little bit about um, your um, personal environment and ability um, one way or another. The question is, um, are you committed to being assess accessible 24-7 in case of a town emergency, even if that meant having to leave your job for a little while to handle an urgent issue? Thank you. The easy answer to this is yes. Um, it's kind of funny. I grew up as the son of a fireman. I know what it's like for the bell to ring or the phone to ring at 2 o'clock in the morning. You go do what you've got to. As a small business owner, I'm janitor, COO. So, you know, we get a call. Something happens at the office. I've got to go to it. Somebody has a problem. I'm the one who fills in. So uh, my dad always said, you know, you can do anything in this world but become a fireman because he was a fireman. <laughs> So, um, but oddly enough, I feel in my career, I've, I've become one of those because whenever something blows up, something gets hot, that's my job. I come in and make sure it gets taken care of. So when it comes to something as important as the town of Collierville is to me and to my family, then yes, that will become a, pri that is a priority and it will be one alongside of the business. Um, you know, the business is important to me because of the families that I support and their families that, that are counting on what we do and our stewardship to make sure that they have a job and they can support their kids and their kids then can become part of this community. So to answer, back again to answer the question, yes, I will be there 24-7, um, maybe 23-7. Yeah, you, know, you got to have a little time off. <laughs> but um, yes, I'd, we, and again, Collierville is very important to us. It's been so good to us. And again, that's why I'm giving back and willing to sacrifice time for my business to be an alderman. Thank you. All right, next up is Mr. Rick Rout. Uh, the question to you is, are you committed to being accessible 24-7 in case of a town emergency, even if that means or meant having to leave your job for a while to handle an urgent issue? The simple answer to that is 901 Six four seven seven six eight eight. That's my number. That's my mobile number. I have it on twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, three hundred sixty this year, six days of the year. And I grew up in a service family. Uh, we were taught that if you're going to be elected by the people, that you need to be accessible to the people, and that it's not just what is uh, the the issues that we have. It's what the issues are with the constituency and other people that you help represent. So. The short answer is yes. The long answer is if you're going to be elected, and I commend all these people behind me and the people in the audience that, that are in the different positions for uh, putting their name on the line, putting their name on the ballot, because it's, it's a tough job. Uh, it's more demanding than you think. Uh, having been elected before uh, to the State Executive Committee for the Republican Party, uh, I've, I've got those phone calls at 3 o'clock in the morning asking what am I going to do about this, what am I going to do about that. Don't understand why it was at 3 a.m. and not 3 p.m., but it happened. Uh, but you sit there and you talk to the person because it's important to them. If it's that important to them to get your number and call, then it needs to be important to you as an elected official. And by growing up and being in that service environment, that service community, being a small business owner here in Carville, I'm a Christian family man that is raising two kids on my own, and, and I'm accessible to my school. I'm accessible to my church, I'm accessible to my kids, I'm accessible to my friends, family, and when elected, I'll be accessible to all the people of Carville and represent everyone in, this, in the town of Carville. Thank you, Mr. Rout. Miss Missy Marshall. Uh, Missy, are you committed to being accessible 24-7 in case of a town emergency, even if that means or meant having to leave your job for a while to handle an urgent issue? Absolutely. Um, I have been a public servant since I graduated high school. I started in the Department of Public Health in a basement in Dixon County. Uh, my last job that I left, I was the um, 
communications and outreach for external affairs for the Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. I was on call 24 hours a day. Um, in that role, we were public information officers within the department, but when there was a state emergency, as with the flooding in 2010, we were the ones staffing the TEMA centers and um, answering the calls and keeping the people up to date. I tell my kids, um, you know, to, to get a job that you love, when you have a job that you love, it doesn't feel like work. Uh, public service is my heart. One of the priorities that I'm running on is servant leadership. I just believe service over self. Um, I got three L's, live, love, and lead. Live the best quality of life and the community that we have. Love the community that we have because when you love something, you give back to it and you invest in it. And then be a leader. All of us have a leader within ourselves. And um, to be able to be available and accessible um, to the people of Carrierville, I think that just encourages the other priority that I have, which is civic engagement. So um, it, it's just a part of who I am, and I would absolutely be available 24-7. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. Next up, Mr. Connor Lambert. Oh, yeah, so uh, the question is, again, this is a randomly chosen question that all the candidates are asking, is are you committed to being accessible 24-7 in case of a town emergency, even if that means or meant having to leave your job for a while to handle an urgent issue? Absolutely. As a, like I said, a college student, I have no interest besides serving the town. I have, I have only one interest. It's no, no personal conflict, no business conflict. My, my first and foremost priority, if I'm elected, will be to serve the town and the public good. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Lambert. All right, Mr. William Boone. So the randomly selected question I'll read again is, are you committed to being accessible 24-7 in case of a town emergency, even if that means or meant having to leave your job for a while to handle an urgent issue? Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, when I filled out a uh, petition, I knew what this job entailed. Uh, I knew it was 24 hours, seven days a week. I've been doing 24 hours, seven days a week for the last 40 years. Uh, I've been a firefighter for, I was a firefighter for 31 years. I also now work on emergency unit for pediatric critical care so i'm up all time tonight every night uh um so i've i've always been available for the citizens of town even now when i'm not on the board when people call me i answer it doesn't make no difference to my family it doesn't make no difference to my friend it doesn't make any difference to my enemy i'm there for them because i love the citizens of kyville i love kyville and i want to see kyville continue to grow in a good way and I appreciate you for asking me that question because I, I'm, I'm 24 hours, I think it's 24 hours, eight days a week <laughs> sometimes. But anyway, yes, I have no kids, I'm available, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Boone. Okay, Candidate Smith, as you know, a uh, random question was drawn. I'll repeat that um, for you as I have the other candidates for you to be able to respond. Um, you have two minutes on this one as well, and so um, you might want to respond, not a simple yes or no, but uh, we're looking for a little bit of a, of a, a basis or understanding of um, how you would approach the issue. And the question that was drawn is, are you committed to being accessible 24-7 in case of a town emergency, even if that meant having to leave your job for a while to handle an urgent issue? Uh, that's a very um, relevant question, especially for me being a pilot. Uh, as you know, that, that takes me out of town sometimes. Uh, and while um, being in town for uh, BMA meetings is something that I can uh, definitely manage. Um, the uh, emergency response, um, I, I plan to be reachable 24 seven uh, worldwide, uh, at least um, by phone or Zoom like we're doing now. Uh, as you know, most things are uh, uh, moving to a virtual uh, involvement. Uh, so I think uh, I can definitely be reachable, and then uh, you know if it's a if it's a true emergency, uh, proceed back uh, to town as, as soon as possible uh, if needed. Um, of course, uh, my military service does come first to me. Uh, so uh, if I'm overseas, you know that, that may be delayed by a few days, and that's a very valid point. However, um, I definitely will do everything that I can to be reachable by phone, uh, Zoom, <laughs> any other methods that, uh, that you can imagine virtually, uh, and. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I don't, I don't believe it'll be a problem for me. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Smith. 
At that point, everyone has had the chance to answer the random question. We will conclude by giving everyone a minute and a half um, to um, give it to uh, offer up a conclusion, uh, any closing comments that you want to make. And so um, I will uh, have asked Mr. Vaughn if he will walk us through that process. Sure. At this, this is the time of night when um, uh, people have gotten familiar with you. They've seen the platform and uh, the questions have uh, shown a little bit about you and, and what, what you want to uh, accomplish it in the role as well as transmit to voters. Uh, we're going to give you a final minute and a half here to wrap up, share a little bit about yourself that you want people, give us your takeaway tonight of, of the people who are going to be watching this online. What do, what do they want to equate you as a candidate with? So go ahead and communicate that to us and Mr. Boone, you start us. Well, I want to appreciate all the people who have supported me up to this far. I think they know that I am one of the people that uh, is good for this city, is good for the diversity of this city, good for the people of this city. I would uh, do my best, and they, they know from the heart that I do my best because for the love of Kyville. I've been here all of my life, and I think I'm the only one on this stage right here that's seen Kyville grow. I've seen Kyville grow to the point where I used to look for it on the map and was so happy to see it when it first got on the map. So I know what it means to be a citizen here and be a good citizen. I've been a good citizen all my life to this place. And I would do my best to make you satisfied, happy, and content with me. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. We've got Connor Lambert who's going to wrap up his time with us this evening with a summation. I believe in this town. I know we'll be able to overcome 2020. Right now we're facing a one in 100 year disease and an even worse economic crisis. But this one in 100 year disease requires one in 100 year solutions, unprecedented problems, unprecedented solutions. I promise to every student learning behind a screen, every business owner facing growing cost and shrinking revenue, every grandparent who hasn't seen their grandchildren, that I will do everything in my power as a citizen or as an alderman to ease and hopefully remove those burdens. It takes a community to beat COVID-19, so that's how I know we will triumph. I'm eager to serve and eager to learn, so I hope you'll join me in November. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And for those off camera who have not been able to, to watch, uh, Mr. Lambert's had some issues with his chair tonight and he has fought them bravely and has uh, collected himself well each time before he, uh, before he approaches the podium. Yes. Our next candidate is Missy Marshall. So I would like to speak to the lifetime uh, residents of Collierville as well as all the citizens of Collierville. I want to speak to the former and current leadership of Collierville and the excellent job that they've done to um, create a culture, an environment, a small town feel, which is now... Um, something that we all cherish and love in a big town. Um, I just believe that um, you all love it. You you love it for the same reasons we do. You've just loved it longer. Um, I, I've often said just because someone's lived somewhere longer doesn't mean they love it more. Um, we chose it, and we chose it because of the great leadership that's been here. And um, I grew up in East Tennessee, spent a majority of my career in Middle Tennessee, and Collierville's first place that has ever felt like home to me. Um, people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. And, um, and I care immensely because I want this to be a place that all of our children want to come back to, to raise their families and work. And so I feel like um, my years in state service, I've had the opportunity to work on the team of three governors, work for eight state departments, and alongside nine commissioners. I'd love to use my experience to um, help move our town forward and preserve the quality of life we've all come to love and know. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, our next uh, candidate to sum up uh, tonight's uh, messaging will be Rick Rout. Thank you, Mr. Representative. By the way, doing, doing a great job in Nashville Forest for Shelby County and also for Carryville. Uh, let, let me again thank you for Tour Carryville and for Representative Vaughn for putting this on tonight. I want to thank the candidates behind me tonight along with myself uh, that have applied for this job. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough thing to do, like I said, putting your name on the dotted line. But 
um, it's one of those things that you want to do to give back to your community and, and, and be a serv servant to your community. You know, Carryville is a great place to live. Carryville is one of those places that you just you, you, you come and you realize, man, this feels like home. Uh, growing up again in a uh, family where my father had been elected for over 30 years, or right at 30 years, uh, it's never a, a one-person job. Uh, any job that he had been elected to, it was a family affair. And that's one thing that we learned. And in touring around uh, Shelby County, I looked to see where I wanted to raise, live, pray, and, and, and take care of my children. Uh, and I chose Carville. And we've been here since Carville was about 7,700 people. We're now expecting to be about 53,000 with the new 2020 census coming out. And one, two things that, that really bother people. One is public speaking and the other is death. Well, I'm going to be your voice. I don't have a problem with public speaking. Let me be your voice that we've been missing for a few years now on the Board of Aldermen. And I can be that voice and see what we need to do by your input and in giving back to the community and, and getting community servants together that can form committees and make sure that we make Carnival a better place to live. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And then to conclude uh, position four's uh, segment of our program this evening, uh, summing up is... Scott Rosansky. We are going to face some real challenges, I believe, in the next couple of years. With the COVID crisis, with the economic impacts, it's devastating small businesses. It's going to put a lot of pressure on our tax base, and we need to be thinking of ways that we can adapt, uh, reutilize through technology or innovation, and be better stewards and continue to be good stewards of the citizen of the uh, community's money and with that we also need to be able to outreach these small businesses and see about what we can do to whether we're infilling vacant spots or just assisting businesses stay up and keeping people employed those are going to be critical things for us to do so i would like the opportunity to be that representative for you um, we came here, chose Collierville because it was a great place. I chose to move my business here and I'm, you know, chose to send my kids to public schools here and they flourished. And so again, I'm here to give back and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, candidate Smith, uh, one and a half minutes to um, provide closing comments. Like I said in uh, my introduction, I want to thank everybody for tuning in, uh, taking the time to, uh, to learn about all the candidates. Uh, there's many candidates for uh, position four, uh, six of us to be exact, uh, and all of whom I've seen are very uh, intelligent and dedicated. Uh, when you go to the polls, uh, whether it's early voting or November 3rd, uh, I hope you'll consider uh, who you think will uh, do the best job for Carterville. And uh, uh, I'm not a career politician, uh, not uh, the most well-spoken person. Uh, and uh, I don't come with a, a long list of previous uh, political positions or appointments, uh, but I do care very much about Carryville. Uh, I plan to live here the rest of my life. Uh, Lord willing, I've got many, many years left in Carryville, and, uh, and I wanna make this a place that all of us can uh, continue to live and raise our families safely. And uh, I'm very dedicated to doing that. So I hope you'll uh, support me and uh, allow me the opportunity to serve uh, you and the town. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Smith. Thanks for being with us tonight. This begins our final segment dealing with the Alderman Position 5 race that we've uh, got in front of us. We have uh, Mr. Greg Frazier, who's a candidate for this spot, along with Alderman John Stamps, uh, who is also vying for the position. The format that we will use tonight is that each candidate will be allowed to come up and speak for a two-minute period to basically introduce yourself to our audience, uh, where you can share whatever's on your heart. Uh, those, whatever the format is there, uh, is your choice. Following that, we'll go through a series of questions, and then we will have a random question that you each will answer following that. So, uh, to get us kicked off for this segment, we're going in alphabetical order in all of these races, and so that brings Mr. Greg Frazier to the podium. So, Mr. Frazier, tell us, tell us about you. Hey, my name is Gregory Frazier. I'm running for Alderman Position 5. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Valerie Frazier, for 34 years. We have three adult children. We've been in Cayuville 25 years. 
I grew up in Detroit and really the only person in, from my neighborhood that actually earned a four-year degree. I have a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics with a Computer Science minor. I have worked for various Fortune 500 companies, including one of the largest architecture engineering firm in the country. I have also recently retired from FedEx Services uh, last year, so I have plenty of time for being an alderman. I have held leadership positions in over 10 Kaivo nonprofit organizations, and I am not a realtor or a developer. I have a business and consulting background, so I will bring a different perspective to the board. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Now approaching the podium is Alderman John Stamps. Mr. Stamps, if you could share a few opening comments. Yes, sir. thank you, Kevin. Thank you all for letting me be here. My name is John Stamps, and I'm a current alderman for the town of Kyrville. I'm very proud of that. I love this town. Um, I am a fourth generation uh, resident uh, with my family who has served in leadership roles here, as well as um, raising a fifth generation. I'm fully invested in this community with, uh, I start my business here, I live here, my children go to school here, um, I pay um, a, a commercial tax base as well as a residential tax base, and uh, I would like you to consider me for uh, moving further with uh, this alderman position. Thank you, sir. And what we'll do is, is in order to keep the transitions down, uh, we'll ask for you to stay there. And I'm going to have Keith go through the questions that uh, you two gentlemen have chosen to answer tonight. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. Um, as uh, Mr. Vaughn mentioned at the first of the segment, uh, we distributed six questions to each of the candidates, of which they were able to choose two that they wanted to answer. And we'll go through that part here. And uh, Mr. Stamps, the first question that uh, you chose to, to be asked is, in your career or otherwise, do you have experience developing a multifaceted budget? Yes, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for these questions. Uh, yes, I've had uh, uh, lots of opportunities to serve in multifaceted budgets. I've served on a nonprofit organization, which was challenged in certain areas for raising funds for that budget to keep, uh, to keep that alive. I've got uh, experience with uh, Federal Express that I worked with there, uh, also with the Association of Realtors. And then what I'm most proud of is the town of Kyville, uh, bal balancing that budget for the last six years. And a lot of times what I try to do is make things approachable and easy. And so when I got into this, I looked at this and I said, okay, town of Kyville budget, my house is, is an analogy kind of like my household. I said, you know, my household, in order to run it, I've got the driveway, I've got the roof, I've got the yard. I've got uh, the utilities, I've got insurance, I've got all these things I've got to take care of under my budget. And so you switch that over and you say $64 million budget, it's not unlike my own home budget. I mean, I've got, we've got the driveways like the roads, uh, construction on the roads and making, taking care of the potholes and things like that. My yard is like parks and recreation, making sure the budget is appropriate for that. The roof, uh, the house, the windows is like the town buildings and things like that that we have to manage and budget. And uh, insurance, it's just, you know, we have to worry about insurance with, with the town. So, so trying to keep it simple uh, and being very proud of, of being a part of that $64 million budget for the last six years um, is something that, uh, that I'm very proud of, proud of. Okay, Mr. Frazier. Uh, Mr. Fraser, the, the first question that uh, you asked to answer is, Carville has the ability to annex several areas that are deemed Carville Reserve, including land by the high school. Do you think Carville should be looking to expand geographically? Uh, yes, I think uh, Carville should always be looking to expand. They need to always have options available, uh, but timing is always the key whenever you're looking at expansion. You have to look at costs. You have to look at the cost of annexation, the police, fire, the impact that it has on the school system, the infrastructure, uh, before you even really annex anything. We do not want to be, uh, for instance, for example, like Memphis, who annex, I think they over annex areas, and now they're de annexing Cordova, parts of Cordova, because of cost versus revenue. So we want to be smart about it. We want to also always have our options, analyze the cost, look at the pros and cons, and then 
make an intelligent decision, not something to grow for growth's sake, but whether or not it's strategic and benefits the town. We'd like to get your thoughts on a diversified tax base, uh, whether you support that, whether you think that that's best for us. And if you do, elaborate on that. Or if you don't, please share with us the reasons why. Well, I believe the town should always have a diversified tax base. Uh, as with any financial advisor, they would never advise their clients to put all their resources into one stock. You have to have diversification. So if there's any one area that takes a hit, you're, you're prepared with the other areas to have the revenue streams. Uh, when I was a planning commissioner for, Shel for Cayuville, I was on the board when we approved carriage crossing. And I looked at that. There was oppositions for and against, but people did not realize the impact that a carriage crossing would have on the property taxes of Cayuville. That revenue generated by the carriage crossing shops help to keep our tax structure low and stable. So that's a plus. We have to look at other uh, revenue streams such as uh, fees, usage fees, uh, impact fees, and things that help the town maintain a stable revenue base. So if one area takes a hit like COVID-19 in the retail industry, we will still have resources come in to handle our basic needs. And that's just prudent planning. In closing, I think it's just essential to have options that we can take advantage of and utilize if the uh, situation calls for that. Sounds Thank you good. very much. Thank you. Alderman Stamps. Uh, as you approach the, the podium, we're going to ask you your, the, the second question that you requested, and then we will begin our draw from the, the, the stash of questions that we've got there beside you for a, a little more candid answer. But sure. uh, the question that you requested that you want to speak on with regards uh, to this, this round is, what are the three largest issues that Cairoville will be facing over the next four years, in your opinion? Thank you. Um, I, I'm labeled more as topics. Uh, very important topics for the town of Cairoville. And there, there, there's three, three uh, categories. Uh, safety, managing growth and development, and also maintaining or, or managing our expenses. And I'll start with the very first one, safety. Safety is our most biggest concern of any community we live in. That, that is a safe community. And one of the things that we just went through with the board was hiring our new uh, chief of police, Chief Dale Lane. Very, part of, very proud of being that, about, about that process. And it wasn't an easy process. I mean, we went nationally. We got 24 different applications, narrowed that down to 12, narrowed that down to six. And from those six, extensive interviews and background checks and everything else like that to put the person in charge that we feel is the best leader to lead our police forward. For, uh, forward. So uh, for safety, that's uh, one thing. And we elected the Judge, Dob judge uh, Leanne Dobson, and she's the first female judge for our community, and she's been doing an outstanding job. The next is managing uh, growth and development. And the other thing is, um, is that we've got a 2040 land plan that we use, and that's our roadmap for development, and we need to make sure that we, we have to tweak it kind of here and there, but that's our roadmap for developing and making sure we move forward. And the last thing is managing expenses. I think what's, I talked a little bit earlier about managing the budget and managing our expenses moving forward. We've had uh, six years of being under the same budget that we've had, maintaining uh, our, our current status quo. And we've had to make some cuts and we had to do some other things, but I'm very proud that we haven't had to do any kind of tax raises or anything else like that. But moving forward, going through COVID, I think that's extremely important. So experience is very important in this, in this field for, uh, for maintaining the budget and uh, uh, for ma maintaining our expenses. Thank you. All righty, thank, thank you. you. And, and you can hold what you have there. Yes. Uh, this, this next segment will be uh, you choosing a question from the, from the basket next to you. All right, yeah, so for our uh, watchers, we have, uh, Mr. Stamps has chosen a um, randomly uh, selected question, and so he has not seen this question, neither has Mr. Frazier. So, um, Mr. Stamps, you will, um, since you're at the podium, you'll have two minutes to answer this question and explain, again, with these questions, if you would, 
um, not just give a, a, a yes or no or, or a number, but kind of explain um, the thought process there. Right. So the question here is, what is the ideal population number for Carrierville? <laughs> Uh, excuse me, I chuckle, I laugh because I don't know if there's really an ideal population growth or, or number. We're at 51,000 people right now and uh, maintaining that and looking forward. I mean, we're looking to be at 60, 70, 80,000 people population wise. Um, but the challenge with that is keeping that small town feel is what everybody, so many people come up and they say, you know, I understand growth and development. You have to grow. Uh, but, but maintaining our small town feel is very, very important. So uh, I think an ideal population number is that number that we can all get together, all coincide, have, have a community that has that small town feel that's very involved, that is um, engaged, um, that is um, responsible um, for all of us uh, to maintain uh, cleanliness of the city. To have a vested interest in it and so that's kind of a you know a number that's just kind of out there i think so i don't know if there's any really perfect number for that population but i would love the opportunity to be in charge or be one of the people that are in charge of helping that growth and developing and maintaining that small town feel okay. thank you sir thank you mr Stamps. mr frazier you'll have an opportunity to answer that same question um, there and so as you approach it, is the question again is, what is the ideal population number for Carrierville? I don't think there's an exact number uh, that's ideal. I think that number varies. The ideal number is one that we still maintain a small town atmosphere. And a small town atmosphere is one where you have relationships. People feel connected, people feel that they're involved, and that they know their representatives. I recently retired from FedEx. I have, can devote full time to serving the town of Cayuville. Currently, I serve on, I have served in 10 organizations and leadership positions in Cayuville nonprofits. I know what it means to serve and to work with individuals. I think everyone wants to have a vested interest in Cayuville, and my goal is to ensure that they do have that, that they are represented, that they are heard, and that they feel connected to the town. So that number, exact number, is up there, but as long as we maintain a sense of ownership among our residents, we will always have a small town atmosphere and one that everyone will love and appreciate. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We're, uh, uh, thanks for sharing uh, your thoughts on the questions that have been posed to you. This last segment's going to be for a minute and a half of you having a conversation with our viewers to uh, share with them what they need to know about you as a candidate and what you would bring to the position. And so with that, we're going to go, since we just concluded with Mr. Frazier, Mr. Stamps, you're your first one to, to sum up. All right. Well, I'll start off by saying thank you for giving us this opportunity to get in front of people because we've got a big challenge these days on, on actually being able to touch and reach the public. So this is a good opportunity. And I appreciate uh, all the, the candidates that put their name in the hat. And there's probably not enough positions. When the music goes off, there's not enough chairs for the people. But there are different opportunities for, uh, for the commissions and different boards that we'd love to keep plugged in and, and um, um, involved. And I would encourage that. I've been an alderman for the past six years, and I feel that it's an honor to be an alderman for the town of Cairo. I love this town. Like I said before, I'm a fourth generation uh, family member that's been involved in it, and um, I'm truly vested in this community. I feel right now, moving forward more than anything else, that we have a lot of challenges with the COVID, and I feel that with, like I mentioned before, as far as balancing the budget uh, and that experience and managing those, experience, uh, those expenses is extremely important. And we need to have experience that's been in that position that has been uh, in charge or uh, watching over those books uh, and knowing where we can go moving forward. And I can present that experience to you. And I would love the opportunity for your support to move forward in this position if you feel I've been doing a good job. Thank you very much. Mr. Frazier, with your, some closing thoughts from you, please. Yes. I believe it's time for a change. I believe that we should use a common sense approach to government. 
my top three concerns, economic responsibility, public safety and security, and a community focus. With my background in consulting with Fortune 500 companies, working in various areas, I think I can bring a different perspective than what is not on the board today. The board consists of realtors, developers, and others. And I think that any company, any organization needs diversity as far as background and experience in order to come up with the best solution. Because if everyone has the same playbook, there's no opportunity to think outside the box. And that's what I'm here for, to look outside the box, to look at things from a different perspective because we have different challenges and we have uh, opportunities that we have not taken advantage of in the past. So vote for me. My uh, website is gregoryfrazierforalderman.com. There's additional information on my website, on my background, and what I stand for. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, that concludes our debate tonight with um, all the, the candidates that are running for aldermen for Carrierville in this upcoming election. And so I want to really uh, say thanks to all the candidates for coming in. Appreciate all of your time. I know the public will really enjoy hearing from, uh, from every one of you. I uh, hope you can all listen and digest and um, be, feel free to follow up to any one of the candidates and ask questions directly. They all have uh, means to do that. Um, and I know they're all open. And so it's really what's really important is paying attention to our local officials. As I say all the time on our Maine and Mulberry radio show, it's the local officials that are really making a difference in your life. It's, the, it's your local town officials or state officials like um, Kevin Vaughn that is with us tonight. Um, and so it's easy to turn on the news and look and see what's happening at a federal, uh, from a federal standpoint, and that occupies a lot of our time. But really what if it has the opportunity to affect our daily lives are our local elected officials. So please pay attention to this. Please vote. Uh, please seek out any other information you need to select your candidate. And with that, I will um, say that I really appreciate uh, Representative Vaughn uh, being with us tonight and helping me and helping us to come up with uh, these questions and to run this debate. And I'll turn it over to you, Kevin, if there's anything that you want to say in closing. Well, Keith, I would just say thank you uh, to you and to Tour Carnival Magazine. Uh, we've had some of the candidates express that uh, these are difficult times. Uh, it's difficult to connect people on a human scale. It's difficult to get out and shake hands, and people don't necessarily want you on their doorstep uh, these days and times. So what I think you've done is provide a fabulous public service to allow members of our community to get to know some of these candidates who frankly all they know is their yard sign design in a lot of cases. And so we hope that tonight uh, the citizens of the town of Collierville have gotten to met these ladies and gentlemen uh, and, and gotten, hopefully they've heard a message that they want to find out more about or a message that they can get behind and support. So again, I want to just say hats off to you and again hats off to all the candidates because again uh, they've put themselves in a vulnerable position by putting their name on a ballot, and I have a great deal of respect for each and every one of you. So uh, thanks for your thoughtfulness in answering, and I think that we've got a great stable of candidates to choose from as, as our representatives. Thank you.